Well, so, yesterday I did a full introduction, and it was an hour long, over an hour long, but there are some problems with the sound quality at points, and I wasn't sure why. I'm going to leave it up, because it covers everything and is listenable, but I did want to have another go with the sound quality today and get some more points, which I felt I could do. So this is an introduction to naval diplomacy extended. Please note the same slides are being used, but this is the extended version. And as such, well, you have me back. You have my lovely mug of milk. I don't drink tea or coffee. And I wasn't going to put Iron Brew inside Winnie the Pooh. <sighs> you can decide yourselves whether it's normal milk or chocolate milk. So, what are we doing? What is this about? Why am I doing a second introduction to naval diplomacy? An extended division. Well, I wanted to put some more points out there. And also, I want to clear up one thing. Uh, I recorded yesterday's at about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, the first one. I wasn't tired because I was up late at night. Well, I had been late before. I was tired because scaffolders had come to our home. And when I say scaffolders have come to our home, well... I mean, we have scaffolding all around our house because we're having the roof done. That was a nice smooth movement by that arm. In fact, I'm going to have to remember that arm can do smooth movements like that. So, and I can't see you having you about here, so you can see. That's all. <sighs> Naval Diplomacy, the extended edition. It's, this is going to go up today. I'm not sure what the time I'll get this up by. I'm hoping I can get this up so it goes up about 1.30ish. And then I can go 3 o'clock first one, 4 o'clock first one, 5 o'clock this one, 6 o'clock live. That's the plan. <laughs> oh, seriously, the bilge pumps memes down on Discord. That's the whole reason the that's the whole reason the join Discord. Listen to the bilge pumps. The latest one came out yesterday. It was appropriately enough the China edition. <sighs> People think these things just come together by happenstance. I don't know. Ay, What is naval diplomacy? Official definition and my definition. We make a lot of artificial breaks in things these days. I'm calling it naval diplomacy. That is a bit of an artificial break, but in a way, that is a break because it's necessary to understand what you're doing. If you had been talking in the first part of the 20th century, been talking from most of the 19th century and a large chunk of the 18th century, you would have just said, this is what navies do. This is what you have a navy for. Yes, wartime. They're really important. Wars are massive and they're everything. But wars happen very... How do I put it? 
they aren't the bread and butter of what navies are for. And this, in many ways, has been the problem with the Cold War. Because it set up a lot of false dichotomies and dichotomies and a lot of false ideas that war is what for our navies especially are built for. War is what armies are built for. They are. Armies are built as war fighting tools. They also do peacekeeping and humanitarian relief and all these things, but war is their major construct. Conflict is their major construct. Air forces they're complicated. Okay? They are. Space forces well at the moment they're all about one planet, so probably it's more war than most other things. But in the future, you'll see space forces will certainly transition to what navies are. Which means that actually most of what a navy is about is about peacetime. <laughs> it's about deterrence. It's about presence. It's about reassuring friends and reassuring enemies that you are interested and you're there. It is about being visible, but also being a threat and a friend. <laughs> Navies are all about waging peace. They're all about preserving peace as best you can, because wars at sea are, by their very nature, far more absolute than wars on land. A ship is either sunk or it isn't. There is no halfway house. The weapons used are big enough that there is not this great big list of potentially variations of wounded and injured. There is which side of the bulkhead we were you on. Did it blast through one bulkhead, two bulkheads? Did it blast through no bulkheads? We always hope for the latter option. War at sea is not as well understood in its horror as war on land. War on land, when you talk about the fighting on the Eastern Front in World War II or in the jungles versus the Japanese, that's a very easy thing to portray in a movie. It's a very easy thing to discuss in a television show. It's a very easy thing to talk about. And you see the people because in many respects the worst parts they live through, they still have a chance to live through. At sea You don't see what happens to a submarine crew which gets sunk. Most of them don't make it out. Some do. Sometimes the submarine manages to surface and they manage to get out. But many don't. Many, many, many don't. They are crushed by the water pressure as the sub goes deeper than it's supposed to do. Or in a ship. And fire scorches through it like a blowtorch. Holes suddenly appear, letting in water. Letting out people. An entire gun crew, an entire bow section is vaporized. By the impact of a heavy, single, heavy torpedo. I haven't managed to find some psych reports from HMS Eskimos beam out, but, and that's just one ship that went through that. Other ships did as well. Nubian lost her stern section. There's all sorts of things that happen there. So, war at sea is not really, really something to be avoided. But the trouble is, the world is so fluid at sea. You don't have nice borders you can mark off. You can't really patrol them without being out there. There is no, oh yes, we're orbiting above, so we have presence here. Well, you don't, because if you can't, if the only way you can remonstrate with a fishing boat or a ship 
down below causing trouble is blowing it up. That means you're going from zero to war. The only way you have a modulated capability is if you have another ship sitting there going, no. And the trouble is, ships can't sit there. You can't sit everywhere in the middle of the ocean because you have storms, you have the water movement, you have your own ship. Rust needs maintenance, crew needs to come home. All sorts of reasons. I know some people now talking are thinking about unmanned ships, but, you know, the nicest way, that's a lovely idea. And yes, I talk about unmanned ships, but I don't talk about unmanned ships launching unmanned boarding parties in complicated scenarios. Mostly I think about unmanned ships as being war fighting tools, present, uh, occasionally presence enhancement tools. Not in terms of a naval diplomacy mission. Actually, unmanned for naval diplomacy seems to be probably a step backwards. It's a retrograde. It gives you less options. Why? Because diplomacy is easier when you have a face-to-face -face human. But we've got to get back to remembering this. One of the interesting debates going on, and I am more familiar with this than others, but please tell me if other nations have it, but what I've been looking at recently is, you have Europe quite happily producing a light frigate program. Um, the Belleville class, the, the lovely French uh, origin design, really. And it looks cute as anything. No one is considering that a threat to the Frems or the other frigates. That's just a sensible thing to have for the presence mission, for going around the world. For them, for those nations which have bases uh, where they do want to go around the world, they have a base area and they forward base it. And they're not really covering out that much. For Britain, we're now looking at it and we're procuring our own presence ship. It's bigger because it needs to be for what we need to do with it. So it's a Type 31s. The amount of people who are going, but it's not as good a warfighter as the Type 26. Yes, but the Type 26 is a very good warfighter. I want it to fight my wars, but I don't want it to fight my peace. I don't want it to wage peace. It's too expensive. It's got too much for priority gear. I don't want to forward base that. I want it where I can have it ready to deploy. I don't want it tied up somewhere where it's got to do a presence mission. I don't want to have to send the ship out to replace it and then get it in. I want to have a ship out there which is okay, which is enough to be impressive enough. But I don't. I want the Type 26. If that's going to be right, that's going to be up fret. And where are my frets? If I'm Britain at the moment. Well, my primary closest threat is probably to slightly to my uh, north and to my east. They're the probably closest ones, which would be considered a, a, a potential physical threat. Uh, the next ones down from that are probably far to my south and west. Because we hope they don't get any ideas in their heads again, but life happens. Anniversaries happen. People get emotional about these things. And ideally, as part of my diplomacy and my global range, I want a task group a carrier battle group and an amphibious task group, about uh, amphibious task group, to farm up so I can form a naval task force if I need to of both to go out. Basically, consider it, and this is the thing I find interesting. 
When you're talking about the army, no one says you need an armoured or uh, you need. Oh, if you have an armoured brigade, you don't need infantry brigades, and if you have infantry brigades, you don't need an armoured brigade. They go right then. We're forming a division, and if we're going to react to this area, we're probably going to need an armed brigade, possibly a strike brigade, possibly an infantry brigade, and they're going to have different capabilities that they bring to set, and they're going to give us a whole division. A Royal Navy Task Force is a Royal Navy division in many ways. Okay, your brigades are your amphibious task group, your carrier battle group. They work together. They're your global response force. And they are a big part of your direct communication ability, your naval diplomacy, because you can send them out. <laughs> but you don't you don't you want to have them so you can send them out. And so you can occasionally arrange for a big visit for them to go around the world or something like that. But usually you want them in a place you can respond to. It's why the Royal Navy kept such a large fleet in the Mediterranean during the interwar years. It wasn't because we were obsessed with refighting the Napoleonic Wars, it's because the Mediterranean was a great place to base your fleet if you wanted them to go anywhere else in the world. Okay? That was why the Mediterranean was loved. That's why they had a fleet there. Because it was close enough to home that they could go home for major refits. And it was close enough to the Far East that if something really bad happened in the Far East, they could deal with it. And the Far East was a mixture of a few high-value cruisers, mostly a lot of low-value sloops. And destroyers. And a little carrier as well. And we'll leave that to one side. You need the Type 31s. You need the present ships. Yes, in wartime, they aren't going to be your Type 26 or your Type 45. They aren't going to be your primary anti submarine warfare vessel or your primary air defense vessel. But they can be your auxiliary air defense or your auxiliary anti-submarine warfare vessel, i.e. the one which backs up the other ships, which is basically a missile truck or a gun, extra gun system or an extra ship on the inner line inside the task group as part of layered air defenses to provide extra defense for the carriers, for the, amphi for the amphibs, for all the other things. And actually, one of the interesting things is actually looking at the gun fit for the Type 31s. They are pretty darn good for supporting, for providing the sort of support which was missing in the Falklands War. Because if you look at that gun fit, and you think about some of the Falklands War, when you're fighting down in those bays, etc., one of the reasons why Galahad didn't have any escort there was because there was not enough escorts which had the required radar to operate inshore available. They needed them in a few places they did have them, a couple of places they did have them. It's basically the Type 22 frigates, and there's only two of them going. And those actually ships themselves don't have enough guns and short-range weapons to be much use in that environment. As their missile system isn't really designed for the that sort of scenario at that time. So really, you'd have had to deploy two ships, and that would have taken you two ships down from as well, including one of your very precious, very rare and vital 22s. You can't do that. But a Type 31 actually would be a perfect vessel to deploy in that scenario. It's all round gun armament and all these things. Make it a very suitable vessel for that scenario. And the thing is, it and river class patrol vessels are going to be doing the bulk of the port visits, probably. The bulk of the conversations at sea. The bulk of the interactions with Russian ships going up the English Channel and all these things, because they have to be. They're going to be numbers. And they should be the numbers. You've got to get out of a Cold War mindset of... It's got to be the best for war fighting. Yes, it has. Yes, you've got to have a core you can build around, which is the best for war fighting. You absolutely must have a core for building, build around, which is absolutely which is the best for war fighting. But navies are not just about fighting wars. They're about delivering security in peacetime, and that's a presence. That's a diplomatic. That is a global mission of interests. 
and you have to build for that as well. And the trouble is, and this is a possibly a dirty little secret, it's more difficult to build for the peacetime mission than it is to build for the wartime mission. It's more difficult because in wartime, you're building to fight an enemy. You're ranging the forces, you're going to fight the battles. You know where you have to be, where the enemy is. That's the area and theatre you have to be. However, in peacetime, when you're waging peace, you have to be all over the world. You have to be everywhere. This is where mass really does have a quality all of its own. Where mass gives you a lot of advantages. This is a scenario where really Britain should be doubling the numbers of river class batch twos and type 31s it's ordering if it really wants to be global Britain. Because whilst you need to slightly up the order of type 26s, you need to replace Albion and Bulwark, and you do need those lovely prepositioned companies and literal strike ships, whatever we're going to call them. They're all useful things, but really what's going to be most useful is being able to turn up and knock on and go and visit a port and go, hello, we're the British. We're here to say hi. How can we help? And you say how you can help uh, to both your local diplomats. Hello, British ambassador. Royal Navy's here. How can we help? And to the local governments. Hello, Mr. Foreign Government, or Miss Foreign Government, or Foreign Government. What do you? What would you like some help with today? What can we be do to be your service? That sounds funny, doesn't it? But the thing is, you keep turning up. You keep turning up and you keep being of service. You keep showing everyone that your interests include this part of the world. That you are interested in this world. You not only have connections there, you not only have financial going-ons, you not have those, but that you are actively interested and has displayed by your presence here as displayed by this vessel turning up on a regular basis. And then that goes on for many years. And if we consider the example of South America in World War II, the Grass Bay went south. The Grass Bay needed support. It didn't get any. It got damaged. It makes its way into Montevideo. It doesn't get support. There are huge German communities all over South America which are very patriotic and still very connected in many respects to the motherland at this time. And yet, the nations do not support them. Is it because they love the British? No. Is it because they respect the British? Yes. And is it because the British turn up a lot and are part of the fabric down there? Certainly. Falklands War could be in large part explained not by any Alanis Malvinas claims or all these things, but actually because the British have been dwindling their presence in the area. They haven't been showing up. Because they've been concentrating on the Cold War, on facing off against the um, Russian threat, and instead of keeping a frigate down there and a ice patrol ship couple of ships, maybe one of the older frigates, just going around, poodling, visiting the port, saying hello, how can we be of service? They're not. They are not. 
They're just not there. They don't look interested anymore. They've stopped being part of the fabric. They're long, no longer part of the fabric. If they're no longer part of the thing, you can do something about them. And it goes both ways because when you're part of the fabric, other people are more likely to tell you things. You're more likely to get more of a warning. In this case, in South America, you got less. Uh, you got both the Argentine, the British ambassador to Argentina, and the British ambassador to Brazil both sent back warnings, but they weren't either timely or in enough detail to really convince the government at the time and the Foreign Office at the time. And you can understand why. It wasn't a major front. No one was focusing on it. Well, that's the point. About the Type 31s and the River Class when you're using them for these things. They are going to be deployed to the areas which are not the major fronts. They are going to be deployed to the areas where they can be the naval diplomacy. diplomacy. They can do naval diplomacy. Where they can be the naval diplomatic presence. And naval diplomacy is everything short of war fighting. War fighting is part of naval diplomacy, but that's usually when naval diplomacy has failed. Okay, in a nice way. <laughs> um, no, sorry. And the point is, what is going to be most relevant of the Type Thirty One's design is not necessarily what they can offer the Royal Navy in terms of war fighting ability, although that's going to be pretty darn critical, but also what they can offer the nations they go to in terms of capability. What they can offer in terms of something to work with. And this is again the other interesting scenario. Let's put it in the Gulf War scenario. Uh, Gulf, well the Type 31 is an excellent vessel for dealing with small boat attacks. You can wander around and help out the local nations with that and continue to work with Montrose has been doing in building deeper and closer connections within the vital region. A similar could be done in Southeast Asia. One based in Singapore. And as we all know, I would like one to be forward based in the Falklands. I, please go look at the 4,000 subscribers Green Fleet for that sort of information. That would be where I would have them forward based. If we had enough, some forward based in Gibraltar wouldn't be too bad either. That all builds into deterrence, okay? As I was talking about in the first video, you know, the unextended version. Nuclear deterrence is known. It's gun on the table, gamblers gambling, everyone knows what's on the play, and no one wants to push that. Conventional deterrence is <clears throat> this is my little watchdog. It will sail around your area. But be very careful. Because if you upset my little watchdog, then the friends. Including a squirrel who is a mighty warrior and an admiral penguin will turn up. And whilst the little watchdog might be something you can take on, do you want to take on these uh, this whole gang? And if they're really scary, if they're really upset with you, they might bring in the sheep wearing a hat. And that's the point. You can scale the response. Because the response might not be okay. Might not require... Might be a little bit too much for the watchdog. And call in Admiral. The Penguin. A senior officer arrives on station to do some diplomacy. Don't need to go to full calling in the Royal Marine squirrels.
or the aircraft carrier giraffe. Or I might need to call them those. And what's really good about all this scenario, really good when you are a government considering it, and you're using naval conventional deterrence, you don't have to rely on allies. You don't have to include allies. So your allies, you might well have good allies in the region, but you don't have to stress that relationship by going, uh, will you mind me basing a brigade of troops there? Or do you mind me uh, basing a whole air wing from your air base? You don't have to. They can, you can leave it so that they are very nice, and they might be very nice and helpful. They might well let, if you deploy a task force, your... Mozzarella, Mukau Auxiliary, Fleet Auxiliary, come into their ports, pick up supplies, and go out to sea to the team the task force going. Because that doesn't really impact on their sovereignty. That's a technically civilian ship coming in to pick up supplies. That's why we have the Fleet Auxiliary. But The point is, you can modulate your response, and that's why naval diplomacy is so strong, because you can start off with the lowest level of just being friends, you can send in a token response to an area and go, look, calm down, we're not here in a big force, we've come here to say hi and keep everyone happy, usually you send that in when you've got two powers looking at each other in a threatening way of about the same size. You send in a small ship. Let's go. Let's talk. And what can be most important about that? And another reason I like the Type 31s, they've got plenty of space for this, and their design, as far as I've looked at, is you can provide a neutral space for them to have the talks. A neutral space. Because the ship doesn't belong to anyone. They're both your friends, they can come to your ship, you can host the talks. It can also be a neutral space for your ambassador to deploy from, like we've tried in Sierra Leone, and, you know, your neutral space where you can extract your embassy to if you need to. These are all options. Naval diplomacy is all about the options, and the options it brings. I think I talked about and like quite a heavy bit about presence already today, but this is a point I cannot emphasize enough. Um, a visit is a demonstration of reach. It's a show of strength, power. I can get there. Britain deploying a task force, a carry battle group to the Far East next year. It's Britain basically going to the people in the Far East. We can come here if we need to. Be our friend. Don't be our enemy. Because, yes, you have mighty fleet. You do. But we also have a fairly strong fleet, and we'll deploy it, and we're friends with quite a lot of people. So if you want to attack one of our friends in this area, we will deploy quite a strong force to you. The problem is that, whilst that shows the power, it doesn't necessarily show the interest. And interests and interest go hand in hand. Presence is how you show the interests. And presence is an ongoing thing. If you're running it from home, you'll need three, four ships to do it. Keep cycling them in and out and down to the there. If you forward base it, let's say out of Singapore, where we already have a base set up rather similar to the one we have in Bahrain, um, well, that requires roughly two ships. Why does it require roughly two ships? Well, you have one ship back home, which is used for training up the crew, and one ship out there, which they deploy to. And you keep basically port and starboard crews. And it works. And you can maintain, and you have to set up facilities so you can maintain the ship out there. You can do big maintenance, and you have to, have to also deploy, and this is where another reason a second ship comes in, 
uh, occasion. You have to deploy a ship out there because it's going to be in a long maintenance duties and it's got to come home. So again, if Britain was going to maintain Type 31s in the Gulf, in Singapore, and in the Falklands, and Gibraltar, that's four ships forward. Requires about four at home to support them, let's say. So that's about eight. Myself, I'd like to have a vessel capable of going to the Caribbean quite regularly, because I think that'd be quite a good area to have one as well. So I'd go for having five based in the UK, and one of them toddle over the Caribbean, occasionally alternating between them and an NSL being out there, depending on hurricane season, and have the four forward. Gibraltar, Falklands, Gulf, and Bahrain, Singapore. So you got the Mediterranean covered. And honestly, do we want to be, have to rapidly deploy a ship to the Mediterranean when most of the time we're talk, what we're talking about is visiting North Africa and visiting allies and reassuring them? No, that would be just wear out a Type 26 and keep wearing them out. So it's easier if we have the Type 31 forward deployed in Gibraltar and able to poodle up and down the Mediterranean. Falklands, again, forward deploying a ship. We've got a, we forward deploy a river down there. We'd have to probably build some more facilities or sort of things down there if we're going to afford the deploy of Type 31, or we could start, you can continue to use Cape Town, I think, is where the Type 31 ends, uh, the river glass end, tends to end up for um, some of its repairs and maintenance. So we might continue to use that, build up a better link with South Africa. There are options. Singapore, fairly easy. It's a demonstration of, of connection to the south, Southeast Asia, of our interest in protecting our friends in that region from what is quite a heavy aggression going on by one of the major powers in the world. Very heavy aggression. An aggression which could be precedent-setting if it's allowed to stand. And that's the other thing you have to remember about international and maritime law vast majority of it is not written or codified. The vast majority of it is precedent. So if you allow someone to use force majeure and basically go, I've got might, so therefore I'm right, and overturn things, you are setting a precedent which you yourself could end up having to deal with. And that is kind of ironic coming from the British who have set up quite a lot of precedents thanks to force majeure in their time. We really have. Image. Maintenance! Again, some people really were a bit surprised by my emphasis on maintenance, but it does matter. Maintenance is critical. Keeping these things nice, neat, and tidy. And so they look good. And for the US, this is kind of difficult because the LCS was supposed to be sort of fulfilling this role. It's not. So it's falling on the Arleigh Burks again. So the Isle of Berks have the warfighting mission, the presence mission, everything. And I'm not really sure. You see, the Isle of Berks are very suitable, like the Type 26 and Type 45s are, to the enhanced presence mission, to the warfighting mission, i.e. to the vessel which turns up. You haven't paid any attention to the first vessel which just fitted. That isn't good. So... Here is going to be a warfighter, one of the preeminent war war fighters, rather than our warfighter vessels, turning up to go, do you really want to end up in a tussle with me? Look at how beautiful I am. Look at how big I am. I basically spend all my life training to fight you or anyone. Don't do this. And that's a good thing. Well, this, yeah, so you need the image. You don't want tired looking crews and you don't want tired looking ships. My friend would testify to that if you look at his bond fleet. Sure everyone's guessed why I'm currently using a Winnie the Pooh mug. 
And I said, sketchy quantitative versus subject sort of objective qualitative. That's the trouble. Naval diplomacy uh, is not something that provides a lot of quantitative data, which is easy to drill down on. It's all subjective qualitative data. It's all value judgments, how useful it was. I can look through history and I can tell you, well, O plus this was being done and this happened. But that's me making a case that that is due to that. And it could sound like a legal fallacy, post hoc ergo proctor hoc, after, therefore, because of. However, it's more complicated and nuanced than that, because you could go, well, the ambassadors at this time made a lot of friends, that's why we had the things, but how did the ambassadors make friends? Well, the ambassadors were able to make friends because there was a lot more dinner parties because the ships turned up, so they were able to chat to each other people more, which meant turn got them invited more things, which allowed them to make more connections and allowed them to make better friends and all sorts of little stuff, yes. And also there was the fact that when they had problems, there was usually a Royal Navy ship somewhere nearby which could help solve them and help the local powers, which gave the ambassador a useful ace in their hole. But, you know, with it... The thing is, sending a check and a strongly worded note, that is what the last 20, 30 years since the end of the Cold War has become about. But the trouble is, the check is generous, but it doesn't create the visibility of interest. It doesn't stick in people's minds. People don't remember... Who gave money? They remember who showed up. Talk to someone who has a wedding, and it's only a few guests. Maybe 200 people send gifts. 30 years from that time, will they be able to, will they remember who sent what gifts? Most people won't. But 30 years on from there, they'll probably remember 60 or so people they could have to their wedding. It's the same when you're in a disaster. People don't necessarily don't remember who sends money. They remember who shows up. And when they are in another a situation where things are better, and they are thinking about other things, they remember who showed up, and they think about how they can not repay the debt but honor the service. And that's how you build friendships, by showing up, by having interest, by being invited to the wedding, the good times and the bad. <sighs> what have we got coming out? Well, this is not going to be a 35 minute of in the end of video again, is it? It's going to be more like a 45 minutes, I think, um, but I'm still going to have to race to get it finished. So, July from the Sea. I'm still taking suggestions for that. I'm getting a lot of them for Sierra Leone. But that may well be mostly um, thanks to Daniel Freeman, who is making them very strongly. Uh, we also have Patreon video, Tony Penfold, on the 3rd of August, The Little Boat Wars, which is fun. Outcome to Spanish Civil Armada. I'm fairly sure that, it, considering how people have been reacting to people's going, uh, you do realise the Royal Navy was also quite a factor in the Battle of Britain and the potential invasion of the UK. I'm fairly sure what I'm about to say about the Spanish Armada is going to also cause all sorts of fun things, but I do enjoy it. It's not... Please note, though, when historians do these things, they're not reinventing history. They're just... And they're not doing other people down. It, it, you do not have to give, forget one group's service in order to properly honour and venerate the extraordinary service of another group. You can remember both and honour both. You can honour all of the various people involved. And you sort of widen the honouring, but still venerate the people who sacrifice. Because that's the thing. They were the few. The pilots who fought out, there was very few of them. And they did come from quite all around the world, and all the different services in the British Armed Forces. Um, there was fleet air on pilots taking part in it, and all sorts of things. 
but that doesn't mean that control of the air was the essential thing that they were talking about for an invasion of Britain, which was particularly, particularly going to be a sea invasion. And then there's people who go, well, actually, the real invasion scale was going to be in 1941, not 40, and sort of going, no, the Royal Navy knew how much damage it had done to the um, Germans' fleet, and they were just doing more damage. Basically, target numero unos were the things which were vital to any uh, naval assault. That is, destroyers and boats. In, especially Schnell boots, because those would have been the critical force multipliers the Germans could have used to try and get their force across. Without them, they were going to run into British submarines, British motor torpedo boats, British destroyers, and something probably resembling uh, the British battle fleet, <laughs> probably coming down at night to go, hello, bye-bye. But that's all for another time. Um, battle of Cape Passaro? And HMS Emerald and HMS Enterprise. Ooh, they're going to be fun. Texiel. It's fun. First turn of July. This is not going to be 45 minutes. <laughs> oh, well, budget. 48 it is. And, ooh, Convoy War. And the Perfect Storm. PQ-17. Oh. Basically, the Royal Navy, rather like with the invasion oh. of Norway, the Royal Navy sees what it thinks is happening, and it's his worst case scenario, and it reacts as it prepared for its worst case scenario. But the trouble is, in anything short of the worst case scenario, what it does is not justified, because that is the their response for the worst case scenario. For anything else below that, you do a different response. And that's possibly a lesson for future wars, in that be very careful, because your enemy might look like they're doing your worst-case scenario because you see the evidence and it fits your worst-case scenario. It might not actually be your worst-case scenario, or that's any of the scenario you think it is. You have to look at what's actually happening, not necessarily what you have the impression is happening. Ren, where else am I able to be found? Twitter, AC underscore Naval History. Patron. I do love my patrons. You're keeping me in books. That is what my patrons do. They are lovely people. They keep me in books. And Global Maritime History. So thank you to everyone. Thank you to all my subscribers and all my watchers and everyone who's pre-ordered my book. And I hope you've enjoyed this. I'm going to add in the links to the various places for this. And um, take care. This has been another 48 minutes, I think, by the time it ends. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.